Welcome to the, the sixth of this, this lecture series on existentialist thinkers. Um, today we're looking at, at Lev Shestov, and he's a very obscure thinker who doesn't get a lot of representation, um, but he was very important in the existentialist movement. He was really one of the second generation of, of the, the, you know, the entire movement and one of the people who sort of brings together these threads so that later on people like Sartre and Marcel can say, hey, there's a, a movement here that we're really the third generation of. And I guess, you know, the people that were bringing existentialism to the, to the states in the 60s and 70s, they'd be like the fourth generation. So this guy is one of the behind-the-scenes figures, and he's, he's really interesting because um, he goes further in some respects than, than even Kierkegaard, uh, but he's more critical than even Nietzsche. And so what I, what I usually do with each of these is I, I give some, some general remarks and then we um, look at the intellectual biography of, of the, the person and then um, we look at some of the key themes. And I usually have I've given you a set of quotes from, from some of Shestov's books about uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. So we're going to look at his, his take on them. Uh, and then we do, you know, question and answer uh, towards the end, but we also do it in the middle if, if people, you know, have a burning desire to, to hear about something or if something needs some clarification. So I've got this, uh, this quote, and it's not actually by Shestov, but I think it, it puts him in perspective. It's by a Polish author, um, uh, Czesław Milosz, who was a big fan of, of Chestov. And he wrote, to associate Chestov with a transitory phase of existentialism would be to diminish his stature. Few writers of any time could match his daring, even insolence, in raising the naughty child's questions. That's kind of a nice way to put it. The naughty child's questions, which always have the power to throw philosophers into a panic. For that reason, such questions have been wrapped in highly professional technical terms and thereby neutralized. Perhaps Shestov exemplifies the advantages of Russia's cultural time lag. No centuries of scholastic theology and philosophy in the past, no university philosophy to speak of. But on the other hand, a lot of people philosophizing and passionate, passionately at that on their own. He was a well-educated man, but he lacked the polite indoctrination one received at Western European universities. This is the best line. He simply did not care whether he, what, what he was saying about Plato or Spinoza was against the rules of the game. That is indecent. It was precisely because of this freedom that his thought was a gift to people who found themselves in desperate situations and knew that syntactic cocoons were of no use anymore. And Maloche is, is actually um, a, an anti-communist writer writing in the middle of the Cold War behind the Iron Curtain. So he sees Shestov, who, who himself had to flee Russia, as, you might say, an intellectual predecessor. And so he's, he's very um, uh, admiring of, of him. And I think that's part of what, what's drawn me to Shestov as well. When you read him, and, and most of his texts are available online, very, very easily on, a, on an Angel Fire site. Um, when you read him, you realize that this is a guy who has read just about everybody and thought hard you know, about anybody from Plato all the way to his contemporaries. He writes about Martin Buber and Heidegger and Sartre uh, and, and engages them. Um, but he, doesn't, he, doesn't, he has a sort of sense of irreverence. It's sort of like, a, you know, imagine a conversation at a bar where you kind of have to, uh, you have to hold your own. You have to prove that you have what it takes to, for people to take you seriously. Um, Shestov will look at Plato and he'll say, well, I think you're right about this, but dead wrong about this stuff. And he's not dismissive either. He'll say, I wonder why he was thinking about this thing. Maybe it was this, and this was wrong too. Um, and, and he's got a lot of very strong views on the entire history of philosophy. But you're willing to hear them because he says them in a way that is on the one hand kind of, kind of humble and self-deprecating. He's not claiming that he's smarter than any of these people. And on the other hand, he actually is, in a lot of cases, smarter than these people, and it shows through in what he's saying, but he's not going to come out and say, like, like Kant would or, or Hegel. He's not going like, to try to impress you with, with his, his understanding of them. So I find that very refreshing. And Shestov is also one of these guys, 
this is sort of a typical existentialist philosopher where he'll, he'll, he's willing to say, look, we philosophize from where we live, the standpoints that we occupy. Um, if you're not a germ, you know, if you didn't grow up in the, the field of German idealism because you didn't go to the right universities in Germany, eh, not a problem. You're going to philosophize from, you know, Kingston or Woodstock or wherever, from where you are at that point in time, the culture that you inhabit, and that's okay. I'm going to do mine here, and if, if you don't like it, well, don't read me. And so I, like, I kind of like that as well. Um, I brought this book, and this will be sort of a little biographical note. Um, this, is, this is my, my book. Um, here, I'll let you take a look. And I got introduced to Shestoff in the research for that book, which happens to be about the 1930s debates about Christian philosophy in France. So I didn't get introduced to Shestoff through existentialism. I got introduced to him because he was a person who took a position during the debates about Christian philosophy. And um, he took a, a position that was actually contrary to most of the other thinkers in the field. It's a very extreme position saying that philosophy and faith really, in most cases, have very little in common. Uh, and when you try to mix them together often, you get these hybrids that don't work very well. And yet, what, what's most important is going to be, have to be informed by faith to some degree. Although, there's some insights that are coming from atheistic thinkers like Nietzsche that are going to be very valuable as well. And there's, he's only mentioned in a few passages in there because he, he was only involved in the very end of the debates. Um, they, they occupied a lot of the French intellectuals from about 1931 to 36. And he was writing his last work at the time called Athens and Jerusalem, uh, instead of Athens or Jerusalem, which, you know, philosophy or religion. He, it's called Athens and Jerusalem. And it was coming out in a serial form in uh, a journal called the Revue de Metaphysique of Morale. And so he's, you know, he's sort of like a guy who gets in at the conversation at the very end of the conversation. He's got some interesting things to say. And nobody's listening because the conversation's coming to an end. So he actually compiles these later on into to his last major work shortly before he dies. So, um, I, I, so I got interested in, for that reason, and then I just kept reading and reading and reading, and I, I liked what I saw. So when I, when I started putting together this lecture series, I thought, well, he definitely belongs in there. So if you look at his, his chronology, um, I've given you this sort of adumbrated handout about that. You see that he's you know, uh, a figure who is straddling the turn of the century, he is born in 1866, so that means by the turn of the 20th century, he's pretty mature. Um, he moves around quite a bit in Europe, ends up settling in Paris, dies in 38. Um, he has a sort of last hurrah when his, his speculation and revelation is published posthumously in 1964. Um, but so he, he's occupying that that... that end of the century, World War I, all the way up to World War II period. And he, he's born in Kiev. He's from a, uh, a Russian Jewish family. Um, and that poses some problems for him. He's, he occupies a really strange position when it comes to Christianity. Um, this is a little bit of a digression from, from the chronology, but he, he, in, in his romantic involvements, he first has an affair with a Russian Orthodox woman gets her knocked up, she has a son, she actually works at his father's firm, big scandal there, and then later on marries a, another Russian Orthodox woman, has three children with her, and keeps the marriage a secret from his family for years. Because there's this tension between uh, Christianity and, and Judaism, and not just a religious tension, but a cultural tension there. Um, he is He's a thinker who says that, that the Jewish revelation really matters a lot, but he also thinks that, that Christianity contributes some interesting ideas along the way. So it's not like he's saying, ah, just reject that. And, and the, the thinkers that he takes up, like Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard is a Lutheran, Dostoevsky is a Russian Orthodox thinker. Um, so the, you know, they're very um, central to his, his work, and, and Christianity itself becomes central to his work. So it's, it's a strange tension there. 
Um, he becomes a student. Uh, he goes to Kiev and Moscow. He constantly gets in trouble with the authorities. Winds up getting kicked out of various schools. Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, he was a, you look at his works, he's a really smart guy. Um, that probably was not endearing him to his professors. He's, he's irreverent. Um, you can imagine that he probably wasn't good at keeping his mouth shut at the time. Um, he, he goes to, to um, start studying mathematics and then decides, I don't, I'm not interested in that, I want to study law. So he's working on his advanced degree. And he actually um, writes a dissertation and it's not accepted. Because at the time it's considered to be too, too revolutionary, too, um, what would you say, too progressive. And Russia at that time was clamping down on, on, on progressive movements. The irony is that later on, when the Marxists get in charge, he's not progressive enough. So then he um, carries out his military service, as, as he had to do back then, and he returns to Kiev, and he's got this sort of bifurcated life where he's helping his father out with this, this business, this textile firm, um, and at the same time he wants to pursue an intellectual uh, career. Where, where he'd study and be involved in literary circles and, and try to change things and, and um, you know, in, in his own sort of view, make a difference. Um, he has a nervous breakdown. And this is a bad thing, but it's also a good thing because it gets him out of the country. He goes to Switzerland, which is a popular place at the time, uh, to send Russian sick people who have a little bit of money to clinics. A lot of French people did that at the time as well. And, you know, to get to Switzerland, you got to travel through a couple other countries. And then when you're on your way back, you get to travel through them as well. So he made full use of that. And, and he, you know, he travels around and, and, and checks things out. And he, he acquires a taste for living abroad. Um, he meets this woman, uh, Anna um, Berezovsny, and, and he marries her. And... Um, he has, uh, he has some children with, with her, and then, then he returns to Russia. And the, you know, during this time, he's actually concealing her from his family. Um, they're living apart, and um, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Now he begins publishing. His first book, he actually um, has to self-publish. And it's not, you know, it's not very, uh, uh, well, it's not, you can't even say that it was rejected because not enough people read it to actually have an opinion about it one way or another. And it's, it's about Shakespeare and this, this guy, Georg Brandes, who was a critic of him. So it's not really that original of a work. But then he starts bringing out other works. And, and notice what his next works are. Um, the Good and the Teaching of Tolstoy and Nietzsche. Now, Tolstoy was a major figure in Russia at that time. And Nietzsche was you know, beginning to be read this is uh, around, this is 1899, so Nietzsche is catching on, largely through Thus Spoke Zarathustra and a few other things. Um, he's not as big as he will be later on, but he's writing this in Russia. And Nietzsche is being read more in, in other places. So um, he's, he's really somebody who's, who's doing comparative work. That, that's quite unusual. And he's contrasting these two figures because Tolstoy represents a kind of idealism, a kind of, you know, everything works out in the end, even though things look kind of crappy here. Whereas Nietzsche is, you know, in his own words, the guy who philosophizes with a hammer, you know, pure dynamite. And he's, he's this caustic agent that undermines morality. And, you know, talking about this sort of stuff could get you in trouble back then in Russia. So he follows this up with, with another book called Dostoevsky and Nietzsche. And Nietzsche had talked a little bit about Dostoevsky because he had read some of Dostoevsky's works. Um, he called Dostoevsky a great psychologist. Shestov is one of the first people to really see how connected these, these thinkers are. And when we think about the beginning of existentialism, you know, there's three figures that always come up, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Dostoevsky. Now, Shestov didn't read Kierkegaard until the 1930s, but he's, uh, he's exposed to a lot of the same ideas, and he's bringing together all these, these people. Hey, Catherine, could you close that door? 
Um, he was bringing together all these people, you know, that, that are thinking about the same sort of ideas, and he's noting the connections between them. That's part of why Shestov is so important to the existentialist movement. Um, then he starts publishing some other works. One that gets translated as All Things Are Possible, but the Russian for it would actually mean an apotheosis of groundlessness. And groundlessness, you know, meaning like the, the ground, the, the foundation for everything has fallen away. This is a feeling that a lot of people have in modernity, that all the old certainties, all the things that we believed in have, have failed us, are breaking down, you know, more after World War I than, than before that. But he's writing this around the turn of the century. And what are we going to do to fix that? Are we just going to like fall into the abyss? Or are we going to just do whatever you know, pleases us? Or are we going to try to build something new up? And you know, he, he realizes that this is a real problem. Um, soon after that, he publishes a set of essays called Penultimate Words that are along the same kind of lines. Um, then there's a while where he's not, he's not doing a lot of writing. Now, now he's become a person of interest within the Russian intellectual community. And they start having debates about his work and about his thought. Is this guy crazy? Is this guy a nuisance? Is he a nihilist? Is he the next great thing in philosophy? Um, and, and, you know, that, that will keep you busy. And he's, he's, um, he meets uh, Nikolai Berdyaev, another important existentialist thinker in Russia, um, who's, who's sort of a patron of him. Eventually, he relocates to Germany and then to Switzerland. He actually meets Tolstoy uh, for a while. Didn't, didn't apparently go that well. Um, then he returns to Moscow. And why does he return to Moscow in 1914? Because war breaks out. And he's, you might say, behind the lines. His, his book that he's working on, the manuscript, is confiscated. And he has to sort of re, you know, start, start again. Um, he goes back to Russia. Russia is in this horrible war where everything goes poorly and the government is revealed as being totally inept. Revolutionary fervor is everywhere, some of it being promoted by German agents, um, a lot of it promoted by the fact that things were just in such a turmoil for so long. And um, the Bolsheviks eventually take power. Before that, his son is killed. And he, he doesn't even receive assurance that his son is killed. He just finds out that he's missing in action. He goes to look for him, never finds him, so he's presumed killed. Um, kind of a great tragedy for him. And you can imagine, too, you know, he's, he's in his 40s, his late 40s, when he's out there looking for his son in this chaos of, uh, of uh, pre- and post-revolutionary Russia. Eventually, you know, the Bolsheviks do consolidate their power. And one of the things that the Bolsheviks did <clears throat> was clamp down on intellectual life. And they, like I put in there, they, they actually insisted that he needed to add a chapter to the book that he was working on called um, Potestas Clavium, which means the power of the keys. And they say, you need, a, you need a chapter on Marxism, why Marxism is right. And a lot of people at the time were receiving requests like this and saying, yeah, okay, I can, I can work within those confines. Um, and Shesta said, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. So I, I'm not sure exactly what the, the scope of this is. He might have said, you know, I'll, I'll consider that and then start packing. <laughs> or he might have just said, forget that, I'm, I'm not doing it, and then started packing. But he leaves. Uh, he leaves Russia and, and gets out of there. And where did Russians typically go um, if they could afford to go any place in, in Europe? Paris. So he relocates to Paris, and Paris at that time, I mean, Paris is still a very important city, although it's been eclipsed in, in large degree as an intellectual center. The time that he's going there, Paris really is, in many respects, one of the intellectual capitals of the world. Mm -hmm. And especially since you have all these immigrants coming from Russia and some of the other Eastern European countries, people saying, things, I, I can't even work here. I got to get the hell out of here. They, they gravitate to, to Paris. Um, so he ends up there, and he, he seems to like it quite a bit. Uh, he gets involved in all these French intellectual circles, some of them emigre circles of Russians, some of them French thinkers. 
he ends up influencing some some important French thinkers, and he ends up with a disciple, um, Benjamin Fondan, who unfortunately dies in Auschwitz. Um, he's a, a Romanian Jew, another displaced person. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting is I, I remarked that he has a lot in common with, with Kierkegaard. He doesn't actually find out about Kierkegaard until 1928. He's heard the name. He's heard that he should check him out. And he becomes friends with Edmund Husserl, who is an important phenomenological thinker. And Husserl says, well, you, you, you really ought to read this Kierkegaard guy because he's saying a lot of the same things as you are. So he finally reads him, and then he has one of these, oh, yeah, this, this guy and I are like totally on the same page kind of, kind of moments. Um, he actually, even Kierkegaard, he, he manages to criticize some things in him as well. But he, he thinks that that's the thinker that he has the most affinities with. So it's kind of funny, isn't it, that it's not until, it'd be as if I were into Aristotle, uh, but I only found out about Aristotle 10 years before I died. But the, the entire time I was sort of replicating stuff that Aristotle was saying. Mm. Wouldn't that be strange? Mm. So um, the next couple of years are very, um, very productive for him. He publishes his Potestas Clavium, publishes a book called In Job's Balances, and then he publishes this book, Kierkegaard and the Existential Philosophy, which is a really important text for existentialism. And this entire time he's working on Athens and Jerusalem. He gets sick, and he, he um, ends up dying, but shortly before he dies, he manages to finish Athens and Jerusalem. And he leaves behind two daughters. Um, his, his pupil, Fondan, who unfortunately is going to be um, put into to the prison camps soon after that, and a lasting influence on, uh, on French and, and Russian literature. Um, also on some English people. He influenced uh, D.H. Lawrence, um, Isaiah Berlin, some of these, some of these thinkers had, had read Shestov. So before we go on, do you have any questions about his sort of like, I always like to put things into a chronology because then we know where the guy fits. And, uh, so uh, who was he closest to in terms of philosophy? Kierkegaard, would you say? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's bringing out things from Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. So he has a lot in common with him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another person that, that he mentions a lot, and I do think he has a lot in common with, would be um, Blaise Pascal, the, uh, the 17th century thinker, contemporary of Descartes, mm -hmm. um, who is, is fairly anti-systematic, the way that, that Shestov is, uh, whose work was never finished. His, his pensées is just a bunch of, you know, essays and notes that he left behind. He was going to write the great book but he died before he could do it. Um, you know, Shestov is a religious thinker, and a lot of times people want to say that, look, you either pick religion and then the philosophy has to just follow, like, in its train. You know, in the Middle Ages they called philosophy the handmaiden of theology. Um, or get the religion out of there altogether. Religion is an impediment. You know, it's going to keep you from being a critical thinker. Mm -hmm. And Shestoff rejects both of those sort of extremes. Mm -hmm. What he says is more along the lines of, um, look, philosophy is great, science is great, technology is great for what it can do. It always gets a little too big for its britches, and mm -hmm. it thinks it can do more than it can actually do. Mm -hmm. So religion is over here and offers... Um, a lot of insights that, that could be incorporated into philosophy, but realize once you start doing that, your philosophy is not going to be something that would appeal to the people over here. And um, religion is kind of a dangerous thing to play around with. Because, like, you know, he likes to repeat, it's a, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Right? Because if, if you have religion and it's just something like, you know, a set of, you know, Nice principles like be nice to people and God helps those who help themselves, which is, you know, we were told in CCD but isn't actually in the Bible, and uh, those sort of things. That's not really religion. That's just sort of moralizing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just a bunch of stories, you know, that don't have any point about what Joshua did or, you know, this guy over here or that guy over here. It, it's stuff that people could find throughout the, the centuries. They could find personal value in 
that could make sense out of their screwed up existence and, and lives. And not total sense, but some sort of sense. So religion always remains, you might say, veiled in mystery for Shestov. So it's not like you could, you know, make a religion for Dominic's book. That would be useful for, for somebody like him. Um, so pu he publishes Athens and Jerusalem. Is that, say, um, a comparison of, say, the Greek philosophers and, and the Christians? Uh, or what's yeah. that about so, Athens and Jerusalem? So Tertullian was this, uh, this uh, church father who actually like became a heretic later on. There was a whole story there. But um, Tertullian had, had said... Athens or Jerusalem. You've got to pick one or the other. Yeah. Greek philosophy, poisonous, get rid of the stuff because, you know, just, just religion, just the Bible, just scripture. That's the answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he, Tertullian actually says, what does Athens have to do with Jerusalem? Right? Mm -hmm. And so Shestov, um, he's, he's considering that, and he is considering the Greek thinkers. Mm -hmm. It's a, like a, a criticism of many of them like Aristotle, for example, or Epictetus. He's also criticizing the Middle Ages, where you know we think of that as the age of faith, right? But a lot of these middle, uh, medieval thinkers were actually um, sort of putting God in a box, you might say. Not, not all of them. Peter Damien went to the far Tertullian extreme and said, um, even grammar is a tool of the devil, and you shouldn't even uh -huh. study that. Right? Uh -huh. And so Shestov isn't endorsing that. Uh -huh. Um, but Damien said things like, God could make things that had occurred in the past not happen. And if you think of, that doesn't, you know, at first that sounds like, eh, that's fine. That's just sort of like angels dancing on the head of a pin kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really important because the question is, is God bound by necessity? Is, are the rules of logic higher than God? Is God down here and necessity or fate or whatever it is that philosophy can reveal to us, reason can reveal to us, does that constrain God? And, and the way the medievals handled this was two different, um, equally problematic ways. One is to say, yes, and so God can't make things for, you know, if, if you had a cup of coffee yesterday as part of your breakfast, that's set for all eternity, God himself can't change that. <laughs> because it happened, and God can't monkey around with the universe. Uh, like Einstein said, God doesn't play dice with the universe, right? Because um, you know, if he was going to call that into question, then, then he could call anything into question. Now he can't be sure about anything. So that's one way to do it. You say, you know, we can actually know more about God than God himself can, because we can understand necessity. And we're bound by it, but, but so is God, so that's good news. Um, the other way is to like shift it back and say, no, God can like do anything that God wants to do, and like if He wanted to make evil good and good evil, or say you know suddenly decide that the sun has to be black and suck all light into it, He could do that. And then the worry is, well, what's going to happen then, right? I mean, how can we rely on anything? And some people say, well, then just read the Bible and that'll, that'll fix things. But, you know, the Bible is this pretty ambiguous document mm -hmm. that you can, mm -hmm. you can make say a lot of different things, so that doesn't resolve it. Mm -hmm. And, and Shostak would say, look, neither of these is a, a particularly good resolution. We need Athens and Jerusalem. We need what's best in, in, in philosophy. Uh, we also need religion. He's, he's sort of like, um, are you familiar with Clement of Alexandria? Have you ever heard of him? No. Clement was another uh, church father who was in Alexandria, which at that time would be sort of like, imagine uh, New York, Paris, Oxford, and, and Harvard all rolled into one. It was like the intellectual capital of the world. The Library of Alexandria was, was there. And there was this whole Alexandrian school of theologians, and they, um, they did a lot of really interesting work. Um, he... He said that Greek philosophy was the second Old Testament. Meaning that, you know, you have the Christian revelation in the New Testament, and then you have all this Jewish literature before that in the, the Old Testament that's sort of like, you know, leading up to and illuminating the, the, the New Testament. 
uh, Clement was willing to say that at least some of the Greek philosophers were sort of like that. They were they were providing a basis for understanding what it was that this, this Jesus guy was talking about. Because, mm-hmm. you know, you, you read the Gospels and some of these things are, are pretty paradoxical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, Clement was more sanguine about the possibility of bringing these together. And I think Shestoff is kind of like that. Um, yeah. Should we go on to uh, some of the other stuff? Or? Sure. Okay. Sure. So here's here's a few things that that he says that I, I, I think are nice quotes to sort of um, wrap one's head around for what he's doing. He criticizes this guy Spinoza, and Spinoza was probably the most rationalist of the rationalists. He even frames his works in terms of mathematical axioms and postulates and you know, deductions and things like that. And Spinoza represents philosophy, sort of almost, you might say, trying to turn the human being into technology, something almost like a computer. Is he a mathematician? Well, it's interesting that you asked that. He was, he was actually uh, a glasses maker, and he contributed to optics to a certain degree. But you know, he didn't actually make any major contributions in, in the field, Unlike um, some of the other guys who we bring together with him, like Descartes, Rene Descartes, we get Cartesian geometry from. Um, Pascal came up with the theory of probability. And Leibniz came up, along with Newton, with the integral calculus. Now, Spinoza didn't have the resources that these guys had. As a matter of fact, Spinoza um, got in trouble with both the Christian and the Jewish authorities. He uh, got himself excommunicated from the Jewish community of Amsterdam, which was pretty tough to do at that time, uh, for his philosophy. Mm. And uh, he had this incredible faith in, in human reason, but he, he didn't think that most people exercised it very much. Uh, so was his philosophy essentially godless? Oh. Why he offended the Jewish community? Godless in a certain way. Uh, it sounds like a pretty clinical philosophy, sort of yeah. bereft he, of any, you know, religiosity. So he thought that um, God it, God exists, and that God is like the absolute being of things. He called it substance. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, all the traditional religious stuff, like the ceremonial law, that's all just you know nonsense that that people made up for themselves. That that's going to get you in trouble with with any sort of orthodox community. Um, and we would get to know God through through the intellect alone, essentially. Um, and we're all, here, here's another thing that got him in trouble too. We're all, in effect, parts of God. Mm-hmm. So it's a pantheistic viewpoint too, which doesn't go over very well with traditional uh, Judaism. And that's somewhat Christian as well. Well... You know, if you think about like the church being the part of the body of Christ, yeah, body of Christ, and yeah, but it doesn't extend to like us being just parts of, of you know, one vast cosmic God, because that would mean that like this is equally God as as, as we are. And mm-hmm. Now, what what um, Shestov Shestov likes Spinoza, and he, you know, it's kind of funny. You you often read the people you disagree with over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so he did that, and he said Spinoza only repeats again and again, um, non non ridere, non lugere, neque detestare, said intelligere, which means don't laugh, don't cry, don't be angry or get upset, just understand. Now imagine human life with, you know, this emotional part, you know, laughing, crying hating, getting angry, loving, over here, and then understanding over here. I think that would, a lot of us would see that as not a fully human life. That would be kind of like turning oneself into a computer. Spinoza saw that as the ideal. He thought that that, that sort of understanding would actually be intellectual love for God. And... Hmm. Now, that's interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, we would use, we would probably look at that and say, well, you know, that's kind of a stunted person, right? Now, think about this in terms of philosophy. Is philosophy just about understanding, just about what the intellect can do, 
Or does philosophy, it's gonna, if it's going to be any good, does it have to try to think about why do we laugh? What do we laugh at? What is the funny? What is humor? Mm -hmm. Why do we cry? What is it that makes us sad? If we take that stuff out, then philosophy becomes kind of uh, uh, abstract. <clears throat> and so, you know, this, this is kind of a typical existentialist idea that um, not only do we have to philosophize from where we are, we're whole human people, and we do laugh and cry and hate and love, and we need to think just as much about that as we need to think about Plato's ideas or about Aristotle's logic or, or about Spinoza's concept of, of God. Um, so that's kind of a, a good, good, you know, uh, quote, I think. Um, which would you rather hear about first? His, his views on, on you know, freedom and creativity, or would you like to hear his, his critical ideas about uh, necessity and logic and, and that sort of stuff? Because they're sort of two sides of the same coin. Uh, freedom and creativity first. Okay. Yeah. So, Shestoff thinks that creative work I was actually just, just repeating this to my, my wife, who, who sometimes will teach creative writing. Um, he thinks that, that a lot of people get creative work wrong in how they conceive of it. He says, you know, they carry out this process of reasoning. If, if the creation is so entertaining and wonderful and, and so pleasurable to us, you know, think about somebody's writing that we're reading, we're like, oh, this is such a great book, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it must be wonderful for the creator. And he says, that's dead wrong. It's horrible. You're taking this unshaped material and you're not sure what to do with it and it resists you at every, every, every opportunity and you shape it into something and then you stand back and you're looking at it and you're not sure what the hell it is or if it's any good. And a lot of times you have to throw it away. That's what creative activity really is. And he says, in another place, uh, a man who's, who's beginning to think um, you know, we think of it like this as this process of ascending to the clouds or something like that, right? Um, but really, he's a, somebody who's lost his balance. We begin to think about things deeply when we run into the problems of life. You know, like when, when do we think about what does it mean to die? When people die on us. Or, you know, when our kids say, you know, why did so-and-so have to die? And then we, you know, these sort of problems... We're always approaching them with not enough tools, with a bunch of people that haven't given us answers before that we sift around and we're like, well, I know that one's not right, and this one could be right, but I, I have to think about this more. That's what, what real philosophy is like. And so he, he says, um, we know nothing of the ultimate realities of our existence, nor shall we ever know anything. Let that be agreed. What does that mean for us? Do we then say, oh, I can't know anything, That's a, everything is, is garbage? No, because that would be like taking a, 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 an assertive stance too, wouldn't it? He says, that actually means we're free. This is another typical existentialist theme, freedom. He says, it only follows that man is free to change his conception of the universe as often as he changes his boots or his gloves. And that constancy of principle belongs only to one's relationships with other people in order that they may know where and to what extent they may depend on us. Therefore, on principle, man should respect order in the external world and complete chaos in the inner. He's saying it's okay to have inner chaos, um, but that's part of the human condition. And, you know, like think about, this is not a philosophical idea, but think about the function of a tie. Uh, this has been pointed out many times by many thinkers as sort of like part of the... Um, the professional or bourgeois uh, uniform or costume, right? Why do men wear ties? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't serve any practical purpose. We don't need them to keep our collars together anymore. That's one reason they had them originally. Oh, you know. Uh, who and, knew? Yeah. Um, you know, we have buttons for that. A lot of times we don't wear them anyway because sometimes we want to show the, that we're informal so we don't wear a tie. Um, it can just quick get caught on things. It doesn't actually keep anything warm because, you know, what, your sternum? <laughs> uh, so what is, what is the point of it? Well, because other people expect it. And that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. So if I'm um, working a, a retail job where uh, I'm expected to wear a tie, um, 
because it's that kind of place, that's fine. It's not expressing my inner essence or anything like that. It's part of the, the, the ongoing communication and expectations between us. Um, that's the way our ideas are, he says. We can change our ideas like that. So when I'm teaching a class, for example, on ethics, it makes sense for me, you know, as a professor, when I'm relating to my young students who are trying to, you know, encounter Plato or Aristotle or whoever for the first time, that I, um, you know, I endorse certain ideas that I may not completely agree with. Like, I, I'm big on, on Plato and Aristotle. I'm not so big on Kant, Immanuel Kant. But when I teach Kant, I teach Kant as if he's right. Because then they can try on the ideas themselves, make sense of them. That's part of the ongoing process, he would say. But in the back of my mind, I could be thinking, you know, this constant thing of Kant is a dummy, Kant is a dummy. <laughs> that's the iron thou? Oh, yeah. That so, Kant, yeah, that's Martin Buber. Oh, um, somebody that, that Shestoff actually wrote about and, and met and knew. Um, yeah, it's like that. You know, Buber has this notion of the I-thou relationship is a bit different than the I-it relationship. If, if I treat you just as an object, I'm treating you as an it. If I treat you as a person, I'm treating you as a, a thou. Mm -hmm. And a, a thou is different than an object. You know, objects can, like, you know, make demands on me, like my, my clock goes off, mm -hmm. or the phone needs to be charged, or if I run into it, you know, it's not going to let me go through it. Mm -hmm. But human beings um, are different because they can make a very different kind of demand. Like, you can actually, the phone will never actually say, hey, what the hell are you talking about? You can ask me that mm -hmm. because you're a human being. Mm -hmm. And I can ask myself that. I can ask you that. There's a whole range of things that are available in the I-thou relationship. Mm -hmm. And we're always, Buber says we're always in danger of taking the I-thou and turning it into an I-it relationship of objectifying, right? Mm -hmm. So Shestoff would, he'd go along with that and say, ultimately, the relationships that really matter, not only it personally, but in, in terms of ideas, are personal, interactive relationships. Mm -hmm. So his relationship with somebody like, like Plato is a very personal relationship, even though Plato's been dead, you know, 2,300 years. Um, he treats Plato as if, like I said, he's a, a guy on the next stool at the bar that he can harangue and say, what do you mean by this? Are you sure about that? You know, he, he opens up the possibility of dialogue that way. Um, and he, he offers us that, too. I mean, you, he's, he's, he's a guy who would be perfectly willing to um, have you say to him, I think you're full of, of BS. Mm -hmm. Okay, why do you think so? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that goes along with this, this freedom. If you're going to grant freedom to human beings, that has to include the freedom to say, no, I don't buy it. I don't accept it. Mm -hmm. And so he says, let's, let's keep on inventing systems, thinking them out. But let's agree not to be cross with those who don't want to have anything to do with our systems. Really, they have a perfect right. So if you are, if we want to do the ist game, right? Let's say you are an idealist, meaning that you believe that ideas have reality and that the mind is ultimately, you know, um, bringing everything together. That's the, that's the crux of experience. Uh, and I am a hardcore materialist. Um, you know, a lot of people say, look, one of you has to be right or, or, or you know, or both of you are wrong and you're going to inevitably clash. Shestoff would say, well, that's, you know, that's really up to them. Do they have to clash with each other? Can't, can I be okay with you being an idealist? That's, that's a, a possibility of my, my freedom. Um, so then he, he ends up, this is what we call a pluralistic um, uh, position. And he says... Um, is another nice, nice quote. Every philosophical world conception starts from some or other solution of the general problem of human existence and proceeds from this to direct the course of human life in some partic particular direction or, or uh, another. So Plato has his problems. One of his problems is actually seeing his, his, uh, his teacher, Socrates, unjustly accused and executed. You know, big existential 
problem there. <laughs> Shostov actually thinks that that is part of why Plato doesn't do what Aristotle does. Um, that that going through that experience of seeing the most rational person get treated in a wholly irrational manner, you know. Um, Descartes has a whole different set of problems that he's facing. Um, Shestov has other things. You and I would have have yet other ones. Mm -hmm. And so he says, <clears throat> um, we don't have the power or the data for the solution of general problems. We're always sort of coming to the table too late. You know, human beings have been encountering, think about what the big problems are. Um, Kant said that they were things like, what can I know? You know, what can I believe? Is the will free? You know, but what are the things that we actually run into that make us ask deep questions? Why did so-and-so die? You know, mm -hmm. is that going to happen to me? Mm -hmm. um, how, how are things so unfair, and yet, you know, we still have some notion of fairness? And does that make any sense? The kids ask that on the playground, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, what else? Um, who should I get involved with romantically? Mm -hmm. Should I marry them? Shouldn't I? Should, it, should I care about marriage? Should, shouldn't I? Mm -hmm. what, what's the purpose of all that? Um... You know, we have all sorts of, of, of big issues. What should I do when my friends don't like each other? You know, do I have to pick one? Do I have to, like, have yeah. some sort of decision procedure? I went through that recently. I understand that. Yeah. yeah now, think there. about what happens when you go through something like that, right? You, if you have a problem and it's something simple, like, you know, if you have a problem on the iPhone, you can go to Google and look it mm -hmm. up and somebody probably has figured it out. It might just be downloading an app or you know, mm -hmm. updating the thing. Or sometimes it's a simple, IT guys make fun of this, have you tried turning it on, turning it off and turning it on again, right? Uh, now with human beings and the deep existential problems that we have, we, we have a problem, right? So you have friends that, that don't like each other or something. Mm -hmm. We've all had that one way or another. Um, and now you're, you know, it's, it's particular and you're faced with it and you're like, what the hell should I do? Mm -hmm. And you start thinking, well, there's this solution here and this solution here and this solution here. And you're like, that one doesn't work. That one doesn't work. And that one doesn't work. And that's what the Greeks called aporia. Meaning, um, not, you, you, you know, like when you go into a canyon and then suddenly it closes off and there's no way to get anywhere else. You need to get through, but uh, all the ways are blocked. Now what the hell do you do? So what do we human beings do? Like, you know, some animals just sit there and go, oh, I guess I'm screwed. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. What do we do? We think. Or we feel. Or we ask other people. And, you know, we muddle our way through. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're actually successful in creating some sort of, you know, good Compliments. response. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, maybe we can get them talking in the case of friends. Or maybe we can't. Um, but when we're doing that, we're doing something that's very typically human. You know, it's often said that human beings are the rational animal. That's part of what it means to be rational. It's not just like doing logic and, mm -hmm. and you know, writing books. It's thinking out concrete problems that are deep problems mm -hmm. in our lives because friendships matter, mm -hmm. right? And how we should educate children matters. And where, you know, where the building fund ought to go matters. So Shestov thinks that these all are things that um, pose problems for us. And he says, we don't have the power or the data for the solution of general problems. Consequently, all of our deductions are arbitrary. We're always sort of like taking a leap, you know? So he says, therefore, let's cease to grieve about our differences in opinion. Let's wish that in the future there should be many more differences and much less uh, unanimity. There is no arbitrary truth. It remains to suppose that truth lies in changeable human tastes and desires. Insofar as common social existence demands it, let us try to come to an understanding, to agree, but not one job more. So again, that, that respecting the inner um, space and saying, yeah, okay, we, we can't, if you think that it's, it's okay to torture people, we're going to say you can't do that. You can think it over by yourself over here and explore it all you like, but you just can't, you can't actually do that. If you think that over here, that everybody should be like uh, 
doing flower arrangement all the time. You're free to think that too. Work out that thought as far as it'll go. Just don't impose it on the rest of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll do something in here, and what we're going to do here, we're not going to mistake for being anything more than just what works. We're not going to hypostatize it and say this is the, the whole universe that you have Control to fit it or... right we're not going to like interject ourselves into the, the psyche of this person and say the outer must look like or the inner must look like the outer so that we can rely on you but again this is I think why Shestoff was popular among um, writers behind the Iron Curtain because they saw that sort of thing going on um, he, he also says something that's really interesting um, about um, creative people like in, in philosophy. He says, um, fathers of great ideas tend to be very careless about their progeny, giving very little heed to their future career. The offspring of one and the same philosopher frequently bear such small resemblance to one another, it's impossible to discern the, the family connection, meaning they're all over the map. Right? Conscientious disciples, wasting away under the arduous effort to discover that which does not exist, are brought to despair of their task. Having got an inkling of the truth concerning their difficulty, they give up the job forever. They cease their attempt at reconciling glaring contradictions. But then they only insist the harder on the necessity for studying the philosophers, studying them minutely, circumstantially, historically, philologically even. So you get Plato scholars, I mean, if you read Plato, you'll be struck by the fact that over here in this dialogue, he's got Socrates saying X, and then over in another dialogue, sooner or later, Socrates is saying, nope, not X. And then you'll be like, well, what? wait a second. What's going on? Yeah, you know, you're contradicting yourself. Mm -hmm. And he's, he says, look, you know, the people who are actually working out ideas, they're not as bothered by consistency as we take them to be. Because that's part of what it means to be creative. Mm -hmm. you, you actually get stuff out there, mm -hmm. and then you'll worry about you know tidying it up later. Mm -hmm. And if you die before you tidy it up, that's fine. You'll mm -hmm. have disciples who are these obsessive types who say it must all make sense. We have to reconcile all of this together. Mm -hmm. And so either they'll like you know work and work and work, and then turn you into something you're not, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> or they'll say yes, these are very deep problems. We must study them with a very minute focus. And then, you know, you kind of lose sight of the fact that these guys were actually trying to respond to life. They're, you know, Nietzsche was not, um, it's really funny with Nietzsche scholars, because Nietzsche is this anti-systematic guy who's insisting that, you know, um, he not be taken as, as just another uh, systematic philosopher. And these Nietzsche scholars out there will try to come up, what's the one basic idea that everything else revolves around? Yeah, or they, they, you know, I'm just going to focus on this little bit here. And it, you, they're so different than the guy they're studying that you're like, why are you even bothering with that? Mm -hmm. Shestoff is, is, is very attuned to that. And I'm actually going to skip over the discussion about, about necessity because I want to talk a little bit about Nietzsche and Kierkegaard. I'll just say this. He, he thinks that there really is no what we would call metaphysical necessity. So, in, you know, a lot of people assume that the rules of logic or scientific method and what science tells us or, you know, experience or some sort of, you know, doctrine or dogma out there can give us the blueprint for reality. And if things don't fit that blueprint, so much the worse for those things. They don't exist. They're not real. Shestoff thinks that's a big leap. First, we don't have enough experience to actually say that we have any sort of rules that cover everything. You know, we've never observed anything remotely like that. So he's taking off from David Hume, who had said that, you know, cause and effect and this idea that we have, that's really based on our, our habits and it's kind of a leap that we put out there into the world. And Hume, you know, shook up a lot of people, including Kant and these positivists who came later. And they all try to, like, reassert that in some way. Um... So Shestoff wants to say, no, it's, it's not, it's not um, there isn't necessity. And that means that we're actually free. Now, does that mean that if I, if I drop this, it, you know, it could float in the air? It could. It's probably not going to. Should I, should I bet the house on, on it doing that? No. Because most of the time, things will actually go the way we expect them to. 
<clears throat> but there's all these little corners where things don't. And especially when we get into things that matter to us more than you know, the law of gravity, like how I should live my life, or what kind of career should I have, or who should I marry, or should I stay married to them, or how should I treat my kids, or what about my parents, all these, these sorts of things, there aren't really a lot of rules for that. There's plenty of rules that people have given us, but they don't hold with any sort of necessity. So it's up to us to actually be smarter than the rules and, and put them in their place. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned that, that um, he's bringing together uh, Nietzsche and, and Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky. And, and Shostov sees those guys as doing something kind of similar. Um, since we don't have that much time, I'm not going to read over the, these, uh, these quotes. Um, I'll just mention some of the, the points from them. He says that so Kierkegaard had this idea that, um, that philosophy you know, would, would try to sort of cover everything. And that actually, you know, reason and philosophy could cover just about everything, but there are always these sort of gaps. And those are the gaps in which the religious, in which God could intrude. And that makes all the difference. And the trouble is that the philosophy, the more rational it is, the less it can see those gaps. Mm -hmm. And the more rational it becomes, the more, and certainly more inhuman it becomes. Mm -hmm. As it tries to become more humane, it becomes more and more inhuman. Mm -hmm. um, now, he criticizes Kierkegaard for not going far enough in certain respects, which is kind of interesting. Um, and... When we look at Dostoevsky and, and Nietzsche, um, Dostoevsky brought up this guy, the underground man. And Kierkegaard is doing something kind of similar in saying you, you need to be an individual. You need to come to terms with the fact that the universe, as you try to see it rationally, actually doesn't fully come together. And the most important things don't fit in there. <clears throat> the underground man is, is sort of going along the same lines as, as Kierkegaard, but taking a somewhat different direction. The underground man says, look, you've got all this progress going on, and you know, you're almost at the point where you can treat a human being as just like a mechanism that you could, you could govern. You, know? you, could, you want me to be happy? Push the right button, <clears throat> and I'll be happy. But I won't really be happy, because it won't really be me. Because part of what it means to be me is the ability to actually as he says, you know, give a raspberry, you know, the Bronx cheer. Uh, or we might say give the finger to whatever system is, is out there. And if you take that away from me, even though it's a stupid thing to do, you know, even though it doesn't get me anything, if you take that away from me, I'm no longer what I was. And maybe that's really at the, the depths of maybe all this progress and civilization isn't really going to make us as happy as we think. It's really going to prepare for some, some cataclysms because human beings uh, are no more oriented towards universal harmony and love than they are towards sadism and cruelty. It, we can go either way. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you think that you can just set up a system that's going to make everybody nice-nice with each other all the time, you're actually paving the way for them to find ways to import cruelty into it. Huh. Um, now, Nietzsche um, had similar insights, um, and they both try to bring about, you know, a, a, a sort of a new way of, of thinking, uh, a new, what is it called, revaluation of values. Um, Dostoevsky um, went through a really harrowing experience. He had been committed to, to a sort of progressivism. Um, I don't know, do you know about this? He, uh, he almost got executed. He was involved in these, these, uh, these uh, progressive circles, and it was at the wrong time, uh, right after the revolutions in 1848 had happened. Mm -hmm. So they rounded him and the circles up, and they uh, put them up, you know, ready for the firing squad. Oh. And at the very last minute, <clears throat> his sentence was commuted to penal servitude in, in Siberia, which is almost like oh. a death sentence, too. And he came back from that, and he, he, he now had, you know, lived uh, uh, some experiences that he hadn't had quite before, 
And all the romanticism, all the sentimentalism, at least he thought, was going away. Um, Shostak thinks that he didn't completely lose it. It came back later on. And Dostoevsky was, was a... Um, he wasn't a conservative, but he wasn't, he wasn't somebody who bought into the progressive uh, ideas after that. And Nietzsche is kind of like that, too. Um, this is something really interesting that Shostak says. He says, we've traced the history of the regeneration of Dostoevsky's convictions. How, how did Dostoevsky arise you know, from, from the ashes? And he says, basically it amounts to an attempt to rehabilitate the rights of the underground man. Now if we turn to Nietzsche's works, we'll find, above all, that though they bear little outward resemblance to what Dostoevsky wrote, they contain definite and clearly expressed traces of those moods and experiences that astonished us in the creative work of the latter. Nietzsche, too, is a romantic, a transcendental dreamer in youth, and then abandoned that. And he says, um, to the Russian reader, Nietzsche's manner is not unusual. We have Dostoevsky, who speaks as if he were not the underground man, not Relashnikov, not Karamazov, and who simulates faith, love, humility, what have you, so that we cannot straight away reject Nietzsche even if we want to. For it would be necessary right after him to reject Dostoevsky. If we, if we want to reject Nietzsche, this is a really interesting paradox because some people say, ah, you know, especially a lot of Christians, Dostoevsky, we're okay with him because he's a Christian, not Nietzsche, he's an anti-Christian. They're saying, well, so Shostak is saying, if you're going to reject Nietzsche, you're going to have to reject Dostoevsky too. And by extension, this is, he's writing this in, in his early work before he knew Kierkegaard. He'd probably say, if you're going to reject Nietzsche, you probably also have to reject this Christian guy, Kierkegaard, over here. Because he's saying a lot of the same stuff. They're, 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 they're you know, coming at it from different angles, but they're criticizing the same sort of pretensions of culture and society and, and philosophy. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, he's, Shestov is, is in some respects responsible for, for um, contributing to seeing these figures as all part of one movement. Um, Why is he not better known? Oh, so that's a good question. Part of it, I would say, has to do with the fact that it's hard to get a beat on him. Um, in, in philosophy, particularly in, in, in uh, is it? Okay. Oh, Thanks. It's supposed to be in, I think, 1130. Yeah. Well, let me, real quick. Yeah, let me, sure. Let me just say, <laughs> say this. The time. He, um, he's anti-systematic, so that makes it difficult to get a bead on him. The other thing is he's, he's writing in that Paris milieu, and he was pretty well known he influences people like Georges Bataille. Um, there's people, contemporaries, that, that know him in that area. But in the English-speaking world, um, he just sort of drops out of the picture. And then when people talk about existentialism, they tell a very selective story. And he is mentioned in one important existentialist text, Camus' Myth of Synthesis. Mm -hmm. But Camus actually gets Shestoff wrong and dismisses him. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would, would look at that and they said, well, look, Camus already dealt with him. We don't need to read this guy. Let's just read these other people instead. You've only got so much time. And then they read Shestoff, if they, if they do, and they're like, this, I don't know what to make of this. And, and so, you know, it, it's hard to teach. It's hard to write about. He's great as, a, as somebody to have on your shelf as sort of like a companion, somebody who's a friend mm -hmm. um, on your philosophical journey. But he's, he's very difficult to fit into academic philosophy. 